Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. So today's guest is not an integrative medicine doctor or author or personality. He is actually an MIT scientist. A chemical engineer. <laughs> and how did you first hear of him? You know, I was invited to be on the scientific advisory board of a company that he started called VitaKey. And Robert Langer, uh, this is just the latest in a, in a series of very innovative projects that he's been involved on with. This one is looking at ways of micro-encapsulating, nano-encapsulating uh, micronutrients, probiotics, and other things that the body might need to make them more available and deli deliver them in better ways. It's interesting you say that because you think, you know, you can take that capsule by mouth and all is fine, but it turns out all is not so fine. Well, as you know, with probiotics, there's a great question as to whether they even get to where they're needed. You know, do they survive passage through the stomach? Do they actually colonize the intestinal tract? Probably in many cases, they don't. And here's a new technology that may make that possible. Well, let's get Dr. Langer on. Okay. Dr. Robert Langer is one of 12 institute professors at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Being an institute professor at MIT is the highest honor that can be awarded to a faculty member. He has written nearly 1,500 articles, which have been cited more than 300,000 times. He has over 1,300 patents worldwide and has won more than 220 awards. Forbes magazine named Dr. Langer as one of the 25 most important individuals in biotechnology in the world. And it's actually estimated that more than 2 billion people worldwide have been impacted by Dr. Langer's biotech innovations. We're so delighted to have you. Welcome, Dr. Langer. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to um, be informal and call you Bob and ask about the beginning of your career. You began as a chemical engineer at Boston Children's Hospital in the 1970s. And at that time, it was really quite unusual for a chemical engineer to work in a hospital. How did that happen? How did that end up being your start? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. So when I was getting my doctorate uh, at MIT in the early 70s, you know, there were these gas shortages, I guess, and pretty much all my classmates and friends, you know, would get jobs in the oil industry. So I thought, you know, I'd do what everybody else did. So I interviewed at those companies and I actually got uh, 20 job offers uh, from oil companies, four from Exxon alone. And I was, wasn't that good, but, you know, they had a lot of openings. At any rate, you know, I wasn't very excited about that as I, you know, I, I mean, when I was there, it was actually okay. But then I'd fly back home and I'd be thinking about what they said. And they said, you know, if you could just increase the yield of this one petrochemical by 0.1%, they said that would be great. You know, it'd be worth billions of dollars. But to me, it seemed like, what was the impact of that? And so I started thinking about other things that I might do. And one of the things I did when I was a graduate student is I helped start a school for disadvantaged uh, kids, high school kids, uh, the group school. And I got very involved in creating new math and science curriculum and in chemistry curriculum. And one day I saw an ad actually at City College of New York to do that, to do something like that. And I was very excited. I wrote them a letter applying for a job, but they didn't write me back. But I liked the idea. So I found all the ads I could to develop, you know, new chemistry curriculum Anyhow, I wrote about 40 places and none of them wrote me back. So then I started thinking, well, how else could I um, help people with my chemical engineering background? And I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools, and they actually didn't write me back either. <laughs> and then one day I, I walked into the lab and one of the older guys said to me, said, Bobby said, there's a surgeon in Boston named Judah Folkman at Children's Hospital. And he said, sometimes he hires unusual people. You know, he thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. But anyhow, <laughs> I wrote to Dr. Folkman, and he was nice enough to offer me a job. He was a very, very famous guy. And, uh, but I didn't know that because I didn't know the area. But that, that, and you're right, I was the only engineer in the hospital. And, but it was a transformative experience for me. Judah Folkman was one of my teachers when I was a student at Harvard Medical School. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, and I had, I had some wonderful interactions. I got to present him with a, an award. 
um, much later after he had retired. But he was one of the main developers of anti-angiogenesis therapy for cancer. What was your involvement with that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So uh, you're absolutely right. So when I came, I mean, so Dr. Folkman had this theory that if you could stop blood vessels, you could stop cancer. But as, as you know, from being there, it was very controversial. Everybody told them it was wrong. And I mean, of course, I thought it was great. I didn't know any biology. I thought it was a terrific theory. So my job was to do two things. One, to prove it was right. And two, actually isolate the first angiogenesis inhibitors. So he and I wrote a paper in science, actually, in 1976, which is the isolation of the first angiogenesis inhibitors, and also developed a paper in Nature at that same time, which helped set the stage for bioassays for all future angiogenesis inhibitors. And that actually involved the drug delivery systems, the slow-release polymers and other things that we developed. But uh, but he was a wonderful man. Wonderful, man. What's the status of that therapy now in the cancer treatment? Oh, it's it's gotten to be incredibly broad. Well, by the way, it, it's, it's a very good question for several reasons. First, it took 28 years from the paper he and I wrote in 1976 in science before the first angiogenesis inhibitor would get approved. But that one that got approved in, in 2004 by Genentech was Avastin, and that's one of the most widely used biotech drugs in history. And not only that, many other angiogenesis inhibitors have been approved for different kinds of cancers. And then for eye diseases like macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy, you know, diseases uh, uh, in the back of the eye where there's abnormal vascularization, there was really no pharmacologic treatment. And now, because of these inhibitors, there's drugs like Ilea and Lucentis that actually can even, rever- they're the only pharmacologic treatments for those diseases of blindness, and they can reverse it in some cases. I want to talk to you mostly about your current work with microencapsulation of micronutrients and probiotics. But before we do that, I know you're also involved in the development of a vaccine for COVID. And I wonder if you could tell us about your work with that, and, and also where you think we are in terms of when we'll have an effective vaccine. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we've done is we've started a number of companies. And, and as I mentioned, we developed ways to deliver different molecules uh, with micro particles and actually nanoparticles. So in 2010, I helped start a company called Moderna. And the idea there was to create new drugs based on what's called messenger RNA. And there's a central dogma, you know, as you know, that DNA makes RNA makes proteins. But the key to making messenger RNA is is modifying it the right way so it won't cause any type of bad response. So at any rate, what Moderna has done, I mean, I I helped start it and I'm on the board of directors and scientific advisory board, but we now have about a thousand people and they have 14 different drugs and clinical trials, a number of vaccines. But the beauty of it is that if you put messenger RNA in a nanoparticle and inject it, what it does is rather than take an inactivated virus or a protein, which might take a year to make uh, and may have side effects, here you can just give the RNA and the body is the factory, right? Because the body has all the machinery to take the RNA and make the protein. So at any rate, that's what Moderna has done. They have a, a, an RNA uh, against what's called the spike protein of the coronavirus. And now it's in you know, really advanced uh, phase three clinical trials. And I mean, my hope is that, you know, later this year, there may be FDA approval. It's, there's still, I mean, it's, it, you know, we, it, it's too early to know, but I'm optimistic that that will happen. The, certainly the earlier trials, the phase one and phase two trials have gone well, and, and, and quite a bit's been published in the New England Journal of Medicine by our collaborators at NIH. So when it will be widely available, that's harder to say. And of course, it's not just Moderna that's working on it. You know, Johnson & Johnson's working on them. Uh, you know, AstraZeneca's working on them. Pfizer's working on it. But I think we need all, all of it because there's, you know, we want to help people in the U.S., but also all over the world. So any lessons from the two extremes you just described, 28 years to go from an idea to a Vastin, something on the market with that theory made real, and now under a year, perhaps, uh, for an mRNA vaccine, which I think is the first time mRNA is being used as a vaccine. That's a very good question. But, but what's happened is, it's interesting. So Moderna actually has eight other vaccines in clinical trials. So, so and, and of course, the work to lay the foundation on messenger RNA, you know, goes back 
at least not only our work till 2010 when we started it, but other people's work, including my own on delivering RNA back to the 1970s uh, and other people's work. Derek Rossi, Stu Reisman, and others who have done work on RNA, you know, back in the early 2000s. So it does build on 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 the academic work as as it often does. But but you're right, it, it, the foundation. One, one, having had that foundation, which obviously has taken a while, then we were able to move very very fast. So let's talk about microencapsulation. Can you tell us what it is and what the potential applications are? Sure. Well. Like I said, one of the well, so one of the areas of microencapsulation or, or nano encapsulation is just what we talked about, you know, delivering RNA. But one of the things, uh, and, and of course, we've done a lot on delivering different drugs through microcapsules to make them last longer, uh, you know, have less side effects and, and be more effective. And, and those kinds of techniques are widely used. But one of the things that uh, we've done, which, which might be relevant to a number of things that you've done and, and others. The Gates Foundation has given our laboratory funding to help people in the developing world um, who have various nutrient deficiencies. And one of the classic problems has been uh, iodine deficiency. But the way that and the way that that was solved was that you could substitute iodine for chloride in a salt. Uh, you know, sodium chloride and sodium iodine. Now that that's easier because it's a, in the same place in what's called the periodic table. But when Bill Gates and his colleagues first came to see me in 2012, I believe, what they said, well, you can't do that for like iron or vitamin A or zinc or anything else because they're not in the right place in the periodic table. And some, of course, are not elements at all. So what we, he said, can we come up with some way to solve that? And what we thought is maybe we could make a salt or, or something else where we microcapsulate all these things. Now, the particular challenge that the Gates Foundation was thinking about is, you know, if you look at the customs, you, you can't change people's habits as much as you might try. So what he wanted to be able to do was, could you put it in boiling water, any of these things in boiling water for two hours and boil it 100 degrees C, and the, the nutrients should not come out of the salt or the microcapsule. It shouldn't change color and it shouldn't change taste. But then when you eat it, which is not a 100 degree C, it's a 37 degree C, it should all come out within an hour. So that might sound impossible. How could you do that? But we, Anna Jacqueline uh, in our lab and our team, we figured out a way to actually take FDA approved materials and do, do just that with 11 different micronutrients. And so that's very exciting. And there's sort of a couple of efforts uh, that have stemmed from that to try to bring this so into the developing world. The Gates Foundation funded what's called Particles for Humanity to try to make large quantities of, of vitamin A uh, at a reasonable cost, and uh, you know, which can be put in, say, bouillon or things like that. And then uh, with uh, Wayne and Catherine Reynolds, we, we've started a company called Vitakey to encapsulate all kinds of things that might help people have, have, have better health. And in fact, I think you're, you're one of the advisors. So we're, the, the technology is, is, is quite powerful because you can encapsulate anything. And like I say, it, it's very stable under different kinds of conditions. It's very stable in terms of not just temperature, but also the light. Uh, we've compared it to you know existing uh, ways of where people have tried to make uh, various uh, in, ingredients. And it's uh, you know, it, it's much more stable, uh, and yet we can still release it when somebody eats it. And in terms of taste, like we've done, uh, we've put it in uh, bread, for example, at the required uh, daily amounts, and it doesn't change the color of bread, even though iron itself is is pretty dark, and it doesn't change the taste either. You know, I've, and, and it's fine. Like I've eaten it, Bill Gates is eating it. Okay. <laughs> so, is the secret stomach acid? Is that what ends up leading to the release? Very, very good. And that's exactly <laughs> right. What we did is we we screened about 50 different materials that were known to be safe. And we found one that a family, actually, because you can actually change the pHs depending on what the goals are. But but you can make a pH sensitive system so that it could be an absolute solid uh, at a neutral pH. And yet when it gets to, say, acid, like you just said, simulated gastric acid, it, it'll dissolve completely. 
Actually, I am curious where some of these ideas come from. I know that um, in an earlier talk that you gave, you mentioned that before chemical engineers were partners with doctors, doctors would go home and sort of scrounge around and find something that could solve a problem. You gave the example of the first artificial heart was inspired by a woman's girdle (laughs) and actually initially constructed by a woman's girdle um, and the, the cardiac surgeon took it in and I guess sterilized it and it must have modified it. But where are your ideas coming from? Yeah. Well, first, what you said is absolutely right. That was Bill Pierce. I was on an NIH study section with him and he told me that story and I, <laughs> I read it in journals and, 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 and that's true not only for the artificial heart. The same thing is true for, for uh Breast implants, actually one of those was a mattress stuffing and, uh, and, and what are called vascular grafts. Those are certain types of artificial blood vessels. And it was a surgeon in Texas going to a clothes store to see what he could sew well with. Well, the way I thought about it was a little bit different because, like I say, I had a different background. I'm a chemical engineer. So one of the things you learn in chemical engineering is what I'll call chemical engineering design. And so what I started thinking about was rather than take these materials that already exist, what would be an ideal material from an engineering standpoint, chemistry standpoint, and biology standpoint? You know, and then we try to put the criteria down, draw these things as chemical structures on the blackboard, and then actually go into the lab and try to synthesize them. So it's a totally different kind of a, approach, but I think it offers the ability to make things that are potentially much safer and have far superior properties uh, in different ways. Aside from uh, micronutrients, the other application that fascinated me was using this uh, encapsulation technique for delivering probiotics. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, absolutely. So again, Anna Jacqueline and, and others in the lab, we've put probiotics in and, and given it to animals and, and we can uh, do that as well. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's diff, you know, different types of designs that we've used in terms of, uh, of putting uh, them in polymers. And by the way, we've published all this stuff too. We have patents on it, but we've published it all in journals like Science Translational Medicine and Advanced Materials. Uh, but, but you're absolutely right. We can, uh, we, I, I really feel like we, you can, I mean, I don't want to overstate, but I feel quite confident that we can encapsulate almost anything and then, and then, and then deliver it. You know, and, and that goes from things like DNA and RNA, which enabled like Moderna and other things to, to, to these nutrients that were talked about and probiotics, which Vitaki can do. And you mentioned the possibility of uh, wound treatment using topical encapsulated probiotics. Yes, you're absolutely right. You could do, do any of those kinds of things, theoretically. I mean, you have to make sure that your animal models are good. Certainly with things that are, you're already eating, I mean, that, that we feel we can just do better and make them taste you know, more stable and, um, and, and things like that, and, and maybe do other things that would be useful, like give a longer lasting flavor, for example. You also are using this technique to address a really serious problem, which are these resistant uh, infections that are resistant to many, many of the existing antibiotics. And that has been something you've used as well with uh, wounds that have MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Um, Are you actually using a combination of antibiotics? Are you using antibiotics and probiotics? Are you using novel treatments? How How are you approaching that? Yeah, well, we're a combination of, of using different substances that have been used, but hopefully delivering them better and delivering them longer and in the, and, and the best profile and, and, and making sure that they're stable or not destroyed right away. I know that some of the early thought process um, of these very targeted ways of delivering is uh, when you give someone a medicine by mouth, of course, the liver has to break it down. And that means you usually have to use a higher dose because things are inactivated. And maybe you can't really get the ideal dose to the particular place you want it because it could be toxic to the body in general. So I think this very targeted delivery system is really fascinating. Well, thank you. No, we're, we're very excited about it, and I, I hope it will do a lot of good. You know, we've already tested it on people. I mean, we, we've done collaborative studies with uh, at, at ETH, uh, and, you know, everybody seemed to be very happy with the results, and everybody did fine healthy-wise. 
Body of Wonder is produced by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Internationally recognized for innovative health and wellness programs, evidence-based research, and clinical standards. During this unprecedented time managing the physical and emotional challenges of the coronavirus, the Andrew Weil Center is here to support you. The center offers listeners a wide range of free resources to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle, including online learning, meditations, and short videos. To find out more, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast. So I have a question really for both of you. In many ways, you're both pioneers in your specific fields. And I know that people probably put energy into dissuading you from following what you clearly believed was possible. I'm sure that some of the career steps you took, people considered risky. I mean, you could have gone into the oil field and just made billions of dollars for the companies and probably a good amount of money for yourself. What is it, do you think, that was innate in you that made you go in this different direction, even in the face of a lot of dissuasion? Yeah. Andy, do you want to go first or should I? Well, I'll just, Bob, I'll just tell you a story about Judah Folkman. He was uh, inducted into the Academy of Achievement that Wayne and Kathy run. And they asked me to present him with the award. Oh, is that right? That's great. And afterwards, he said to me, you know, at Harvard Medical School, the faculty say they try to train students to think for themselves. And now that one of them has done it, they don't like it. (laughs) <laughs> and I thought that was a terrific compliment. So, I, I think that's great. But he's right. He's right. Yeah. That's a great story. Well, he was a wonderful role model. And yeah, in every every way. I mean, it's related. You know, to me, I, I mean, I had the simple idea that I wanted to do some good, I guess. And I didn't feel excited about going into the oil industry and I, and doing things like teaching, um, I couldn't get right away. And and actually, what you said is also right. You know, even after I worked in Dr. Folkman's lab and we published uh, these things, which have turned out both the angiogenesis work and the drug delivery work, which have both turned out to have a big impact on the world. I, you know, I, I, I wanted to get a faculty job. So I applied to chemical engineering departments and because uh, that's what I am. And no chemical engineering department in the world would hire me. They kept saying this bio stuff you're doing doesn't make any sense in a chemical engineering department. So I didn't get any jobs there. But then, then what happened was, you know, I, I tried to get grants for what I did. And actually, the first nine all got rejected very badly because uh, people said, again, how could a chemical engineer do cancer research or anything? And then um, I ended up getting a job in a nutrition department. And the reason I got it was uh, Dr. Folkman knew a man named Nevin Scrimshaw, who was a uh, uh, really a, a well-known nutritionist, and he was head of that department. But he was the kind of department head that was more what I'll call a benevolent dictator in the sense that he liked me, so he hired me, but he didn't ask the rest of the department what they thought, which would have been okay, <laughs> except for the fact that the year after I joined the department, he left. So pretty much the entire senior faculty gave me advice, and their advice is I should leave too. Oh, wow. Uh, and so that was a very discouraging. And then, and they kept saying this idea of encapsulation and drug delivery, you know, is ridiculous. You shouldn't bother doing it. You know, it's, it's um, you, and you better start looking for another job. Wow. And yet, I know in your lab at MIT, uh, the Langer Lab, uh, you really value diversity. And it seems to me the world has maybe come to value collaboration across fields more. I mean, we at our Center for Integrative Medicine do work with biomedical engineering to do projects around mHealth. So I think the world has caught up a little bit. What's your experience? I think it has caught up a little bit too. I mean, it used to be that, you know, I mean, just as an example, like when I went to college, you know, there was a building for chemical engineering, a building for English, a building for biology. You know, now at MIT, what they did, they even built a building like the one I'm in now has like seven different types of engineers and has biologists. So I think that slowly it's changing. I mean, one of the things I, I like to think is that we contributed to it. You know, I, what what's happened is when I was a uh, start trying to find jobs. There were all these chemical engineering departments. And like I say, they didn't think bio things were important. Now, you know, half 
the bioengineering, half the chemical engineering departments in the country or close to it have bio in their name. And 400 people from our lab are professors. So it's, uh, I mean, that have graduated over the years. And, and they've made a huge difference because they keep training others and so forth in it. So, uh, but it, it's taken a while. But I agree with you that things are starting to move more and more in that direction. I think you can still move even further. Yeah. Uh, in medicine, also, it's quite siloed. And there is a saying that uh, people who train together then practice together. And so clearly, not everybody trains together. Uh, you may not have any training, for example, with a physical therapist, and then you don't have a clue, let alone someone who does acupuncture or nutrition, and you really don't know how to refer to them. Right. No, I agree. Let me say, Victoria, you know, I I'm licensed as a general practitioner, which I'm very proud of. That is a dying breed. And the great problem in medicine is that we have so few generalists and so many specialists. And this is often to the detriment of patients' health. I cannot tell you how many patients I've seen who have seen so many specialists and no one has a big picture view. No one is able to put this all together and see what might be the root cause of a problem. I think we have a, a terrific need for more generalists in medicine and probably in science also. Yeah, I agree. I think that's well said. I, I agree with you. Well, I'm trained in family medicine, and I also consider myself a generalist. I often wish for the old Renaissance thinkers, you know, the people who were trained in medicine and engineering and Latin and music. And it seems that these days we don't do that. I mean, the, the disciplines have gotten so enormous. So maybe the best we can hope for is that people really do learn some common language and are able to collaborate effectively. Yeah, no, I think you're right. In fact, when people ask me, you know, what was important in my career, I always say that experience at Children's Hospital because I said, because I say to them, you know, I knew I was able to know a little bit about chemical engineering and a little bit about medicine and just put them together in different ways. But most people haven't had that advantage or whatever you'd call it. They've probably learned just one or the other. And the point that you made about materials, the question you asked me, that's a great example. Clinicians thought about it like what's in my house that I can use and a chemical engineer might say, well, but maybe you could synthesize it. Bob, is there an idea or project that you're just beginning work on that you're excited about now? Well, there, there are a number of them. You know, one thing we haven't talked about that, that we do a lot of work on that I'm very excited about is another one of the people I met when I was in uh, Judah Folkman's lab was uh, Jay Vacanti. And Jay uh, became head of the liver transplant program later at Children's Hospital. He's now at Mass General. And one of the things he pointed out to me in the early 80s was, you know, he had, was treating little babies who, who was, were dying of liver failure. He said, is there some way that, that he and I could make organs or tissues from scratch? So we came up with this idea of what's now called tissue engineering. And it basically would involve putting the right kind of cell, well, the initial thing we thought about was putting the right kind of cells on, on materials that I might design and, and do it in a certain way and grow it in a bioreactor. But today, that technique is is been FDA approved for making skin for burn victims and people with diabetic skin ulcers. But we're working in the lab on a number of things, um, and my students have worked on a number of things as well. So in the lab and actually in some spinoff companies, you know, one of my students is making blood vessels for people with heart disease because you can't make small diameter blood vessels. You have to sew them in. Another uh, couple of my students are working on ways of, of restoring hearing loss because we found some molecules that can cause uh, hair cells to, to proliferate. Uh, another group was trying to make new spinal cords. Another group making a, a pancreas. And, and, and again, some of these things that it's also led to, you know, because people do animal testing and human testing, but now you can try to, and again, this is at an early stage, but make organs and tissues on a chip. So one of my other uh, postdocs uh, who, who actually went to the, or, well, now he's a professor at MIT, Gio Traverso, he and, and, and we, we made uh, a gastrointestinal track on a chip. And another couple of my students made a heart on a chip. And, and, and then even, which, which will come to the last thing, you know, is that one of my students is a professor in Israel. She's a stem cell expert, and she's actually using this technique to make meat from scratch. And, and then there's a company in New York that's making leather. So, so this is a whole area we're trying to develop the science for more that I think, you know, will hopefully be very, very important someday. I'd love 
to hear about the major things that you're excited about and that you're doing. I mean, of course, I've read Andy's books a number of years ago, and I'd love to hear about what you're doing and, um, uh, you know, what the things you are, you're doing that you're most excited about. Well, Bob, one of the areas that I think uh, of uh, mutual interest, uh, we've done a lot of work in the area of integrative mental health. Uh, we think there is a, a, an urgent need for a new, a new paradigm to replace the biomedical model in psychiatry that has been very limiting. And uh, one aspect of this uh, new paradigm would be looking at nutritional influences on mental health. And I think that's quite relevant to some of the work you're doing with uh, Vitakey. Uh, and as you know, I put you in touch with several uh, people who've spoken at our conferences on integrated mental health about using uh, targeted micronutrient delivery to really improve brain function and emotional wellness. And I, I think that's a, you know, a very important area for the future. Well, I'm very glad you said that. I think you're right. And in fact, the other question I was going to ask you are, are even more ideas about what uh, Vitaki could encapsulate that can you know, really change people's lives. But mental health would be fantastic. And, and that, that, that's, great. that's a great, great point. You mentioned your work in developing nations, and in theory, because we have such abundance, we wouldn't have micronutrient deficiencies in our country, but we do uh, for a lot of reasons, including we call it the SAD diet, which is the standard American diet. <laughs> uh, so the you know the the SAD diet is pretty unhealthy, but other people are really worried that we've depleted our soil uh, because of all of the pesticides and herbicides that we've used on it over over time uh, that the soil is just not as nutritious. So even if you grow something, you know, and you think you're serving someone healthy food, it still may not have all the magnesium that used to be, for example, in the plant. I say, well, uh, those are both interesting. I mean, I, I'd never thought about the last one. That's a great point. So magnesium for plants, that's interesting. Well, I mean, there's a lot of that's one of the nutrients that's thought to be deficient at the, this point. But there are a lot of the um, of the nutrients that you would expect people to have adequate amounts from just a nutritious diet, and now that's more questionable. Huh. No, I, I wasn't even aware of that. That's that's really important. I mean, that's very interesting. I have a vice question for you. We like to ask our guests, uh, here we are talking about health and healthy behaviors. We like to ask our guests if there's one vice, a secret vice that they'd be comfortable sharing with all of the listeners for this program. <laughs> a guilty pleasure. A guilty pleasure. Well, I don't know if it's a vice or not, but I'm a huge chocolate fanatic. <laughs> we are too. So that's true. <laughs> we consider that a healthy pleasure, not a guilty pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love chocolate. Well, I... Well, when I, I probably eat too much, you know, it's funny, like I'm in our place in Cape Cod and there's this great candy store, Ben and Bill's that I keep going to and getting, you know, they have all these dark chocolate with, you know, maple cream or wintergreen cream. And I, I, I eat way too many of them. <laughs> but there, but that, that, there's no question, chocolate and chocolate candy and ice cream, those would be my two, two vices. Yeah, in the field of nutrition, huh? <laughs> right, right. But I keep thinking again with Vitaki, we'll like healthy ice cream too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for participating. It's a great pleasure to meet you virtually and hear about your work. It's very exciting. Well, it's mutual. I, it's great talking to both of you. And I mean, really, that you've done such amazing stuff and, you know, just really appreciate your help and everything. Well, I, I just have to second Andy. Um, you know, clearly you have had an impact, which was the goal you had setting out on the lives of so many people. And my guess is generations and generations more. Um, so thank you for your work. Well, we're trying and we look forward to collaborating with you both. So that would be thank terrific. You. Thank you. Take good really care. Fun. All right. Thank you too. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Learn more about topics featured on the Body of Wonder podcast and how to apply them to your everyday health with My Wellness Coach, a free mobile app from the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Download today at mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu. That's mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520-621-3950. Again, 520-621-3950. 
or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs.